Hare Krishna. Everyone, welcome back to the daily readings of Srila Prabhupada's books. We're here, locked down in this lovely haven called Hive, uh, the live studios for our daily readings for this time of our lives. Um, blissed out, actually, even in, in, in the midst of the virus uh, pandemic, we're actually blissed out reading Srila Prabhupada's books. And this is what uh, Krishna is trying to tell the whole world. You have to stay home, stay home and read Prabhupada's books. Srimad Bhagava Mahima Stotram. Srimad Bhagavata Mahima Stotram. Uh, Srila Sanatan Goswami's glorification of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which we've been reading now for quite some time. We reach the twelfth canto, the last canto of the Bhagavatam. And it goes like this Sarva Shastravdipi Yusha, Sarva Vedaika Satpala, Sarva Siddhanta Ratnadya, Sarva Lokaika Drik Prada. O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truths. You are the only giver of sight to all the worlds. Sarva Bhagavata Prana Srimad Bhagavata Prabho Kalidvan Duritaditya Sri Krishna Parivartita O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master Srimad Bhagavata, you are the sun risen in the darkness of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya Prema Varshakshadayate Sarvada Sarvasevyaya Sri Krishnaya Namostume I bow down to you who were supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna himself. Madeka Bando Matsangin Madguru Mad Mahadana Man Nistadaka Mad Bhagya Mad Ananda Namostute My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. Asadu Saduta Dayin Atini Chochata Kada O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart with my voice and in my and my voice with pure love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 So we've reached the twelfth canto. <coughs> Canto is entitled The Age of Deterioration. <clears throat> Chapter 4 The Four Categories of Universal Annihilation. <clears throat> this chapter discusses the four types of annihilation constant, occasional, material, and final. And the chanting of the holy name of Lord Hari, which is the only means for st of stopping the cycle of material life. One thousand cycles of four ages constitute one day of Brahma. And each day of Brahma, called the Kalpa, contains within it the lifetimes of 14 Manus. The duration of Brahma's night is the same 
is that of his day. During his night, Brahma sleeps and the three planetary systems meet destruction. This is the Naimitaka or occasional annihilation. <clears throat> when Brahma's lifespan of 100 years is finished, there occurs the Prakritika or total material annihilation. At that time, the seven elements of material nature, beginning with the Mahat and the entire universal egg composed of them, are destroyed. When a person achieves knowledge of the Absolute, he understands factual reality. He perceives the entire created universe as separate from the Absolute and therefore unreal. That is called the Atyantika, or final annihilation or liberation. At every moment, time invisibly transforms the bodies of all created beings and all other manifestations of matter. This process of transformation causes the living entity to undergo the constant annihilation of birth and death. Those possessed of subtle vision state that all, creature, all creatures, including Brahma himself, are always subject to generation and annihilation. Material life means subjugation to birth and death, or generation and annihilation. The only boat suitable for crossing the ocean of material existence, which is otherwise impossible to cross, is the boat of submissive hearing of the nectarian pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Well, that settles that. Text 1. Chukadev Goswami said, My dear King, I have already described to you the measurements of time, beginning from the smallest fraction measured by a moment of a single atom up to the total lifespan of Brahma. I have also discussed the measurement of the different millennia of universal history. Now hear about the time of Brahma's day and the process of annihilation. Text 2 <clears throat> 1,000 ages of four ages constitute a single day of Brahma, known as a Kalpa. In that period, O King, fourteen Manus come and go. Text 3 After one day of Brahma, annihilation occurs during his night, which is of the same duration. At that time, all the three planetary systems are subject to destruction. Text 4 this is called the Naimitika, or occasional annihilation, during which the original creator, Lord Narayana, lies down upon the bed of Anantashesha and absorbs the entire universe within himself while Brahma sleeps. Text, 55, uh, text 5 When the two halves of the lifetime of Lord Brahma the most elevated created being are complete. The seven basic elements of creation are annihilated. Text 6 O King, upon the annihilation of the material elements, the universal egg comprising the elemental amalgamation of creation is confronted with destruction. Purport It is significant that Chukadev Goswami the spiritual master of King Prikshit is broadly discussing cosmic annihilation just before the death of his disciple. By attentively hearing the story of universal destruction, one can easily understand one's personal departure from this material world to be an insignificant incident within the gigantic scope of the total material manifestation. By his deep 
and relevant discussions of the creation of God. Shukadev Goswami is an ideal spiritual master. Is as as an ideal spiritual master, is preparing his disciple for the moment of death. Text seven. As annihilation approaches, O King, there will be no rain upon the earth for one hundred years. Drought, drought, will lead to famine, and the starving populace will literally consume one another. The, the inhabitants of the earth, bewildered by the force of time, will gradually be destroyed. Text 8 the sun, is the, the sun, in its annihilating form, will drink up with its terrible rays all the water of the ocean, of living bodies, and of the earth itself. But the devastating sun will not give any rain in return. Text 9 Next, the great fire of annihilation will flare up from the mouth of Lord Sankarshan. Carried by the mighty force of the wind, this fire will burn throughout the universe, scorching the lifeless cosmic shell. Burn from all sides, from, the, from above by the blazing sun and from below by the fire of Lord Sankrishan, the universal sphere will glow like a burning ball of cow dung. 11. A great and terrible wind of destruction will begin to blow for more than 100 years and the sky covered with dust will turn gray. After that, O King, groups of multicolored clouds will gather, roaring terribly with thunder, and will pour down floods of rain for one hundred years. At that time, the shell of the universe will fill up with water, forming a single cosmic ocean. 14. As the entire universe is flooded, the water will rob the earth of its unique quality of fragrance and the element earth, deprived of its distinguishing quality, will be dissolved. Purport As clearly explained throughout Srimad Bhagavatam, the first element, sky, possesses the unique quality of sound. As creation expands, the second element, air, comes into being and it possesses sound and touch. The third element, fire, possesses sound, touch, and form. And the fourth element, water, possesses sound, touch, form, and flavor. The earth possesses sound, touch, form, flavor, and aroma. As each element loses its unique distinguishing quality, it's nat it naturally becomes indistinguishable from the more subtle elements and it thus effectively dissolved as a unique entity. 15 to 19. The element fire then seizes the taste from the element water, which, deprived of its unique quality, taste, merges into fire. Air seizes the form inherent in fire, and then fire, deprived of form, merges into air. The, the element ether seizes the quality of air, namely touch, and that air enters into ether. Then, O king, false ego in ignorance seizes sound, the quality of ether, after which ether merges into false ego. False ego, in the mode of passion, takes hold of the senses, and false ego, in the mode of goodness, absorbs the demigods. Then the whole Mahatattva seizes the false ego with its various functions. Then the total Mahatattva seizes false ego along with its various functions, and that Mahat is seized by the three false, the three 
is seized by the three basic modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. My dear King Parikshit, these modes are further o overtaken by the original unmanifest form of nature impelled by time. That un unmanifest nature is not subject to the six kinds of transformation caused by the influence of time. Rather, it has no beginning and no end. It is the unmanifest, eternal, and infallible cause of creation. 20 and 21 In the unmanifest stage of material nature called pradhan, there is no expression of words, no mind, and no manifestation of the subtle elements beginning from the mahat, nor are there the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance. There is no life air or intelligence, nor any senses or demigods. There is no definite arrangement of planetary systems, nor are there present the different stages of consciousness, sleep, wakefulness, and deep sleep. There is no ether, water, there is no ether, water, earth, air, fire, or sun. The situation is just like that of complete sleep or avoidness. Ind indeed, it is indescribable. Authorities in spiritual science explain, however, that since Pradhan is the original substance, it is the actual basis of material creation. 22. This is the annihilation called Prakritika. Prakritika, during which the energies belonging to the Supreme Person and His unmanifest material nature, disassembled by the force of time, are deprived of their potencies and merge totally, together totally. 23. It is the Absolute Truth alone who manifests in the forms of intelligence, the senses, and the objects of sense perception, and who is their ultimate basis. Whatever has a beginning and an end is insubstantial because of being an object perceived by limited senses and because of being non-different from its own cause. Purport The word drishatva indicates that all subtle and gross material manifestations are made visible by the potency of the Supreme Lord and again become invisible or unmanifest at the time of annihilation. There are therefore in essence, they are therefore in essence, not separate from the source of their expansion and withdrawal. Text 24 A lamp, the eye that views by the light of that lamp and the visible form that is viewed, are all basically non-different from the element of fire. In the same way, intelligence, the senses, and sense perceptions have no existence separate from the, from the supreme reality, although, although that absolute truth remains, remains totally distinct from them. 25. The three states of intelligence are called waking consciousness, waking consciousness, sleep, and deep sleep. But, my dear King, the variegated experiences created for the pure living entity by these three states are nothing more than illusion. Purport Pure Krishna consciousness exists beyond the various stages of material awareness, just as darkness vanishes in the presence of light. So illusory material intelligence, which is experienced as normal perception, dreaming and deep sleep, completely vanishes in the brilliant presence of pure Krishna consciousness, the constitutional condition of every living entity. Just as clouds in the sky come into being and are then dispersed by the amalgamation and dissolution of their constituent elements. This material universe is created and destroyed within the Absolute Truth by the amalgamation 
and disillusion of its elemental con constitu con constituent, constituent parts. I'll read that again. Just as clouds in the sky come into being and are then dispersed by the amalgamation and dissolution of their constituent elements, this material universe is created and destroyed within the absolute truth by the amalgamation and dissolution of its elemental constituent parts. Text 27 My dear King, it is stated in the Vedanta Sutra that the ingredient cause that constitutes any manifested product in this universe can be perceived as a separate reality, just as the threads that make up a cloth can be perceived separately from their product. Text 28 Anything experienced in terms of general cause and specific effect must be an illusion, because such causes and effects exist only relative to each other. Indeed, whatever has a beginning and an end is unreal. Purport The nature of a material cause cannot be perceived within the perception of the effect. For example, the burning nature of fire cannot be perceived without observing the effect of fire, such as burning object, a burning object or ashes. Simil similarly, the saturating quality of water cannot be understood without observing the effect, a saturated cloth or paper. The organizational power of a man cannot be understood without observing the effect of his dynamic work, namely a solid institution. In this way, not only do effects depend upon their causes, but the perception of the cause also depends upon observation of the effect. Thus both are defined relatively and have a beginning and an end. The conclusion is that all such material causes and effects are essentially, essentially temporary and relative and consequently illusory. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, although the cause of all causes, has no beginning or end. Therefore, He is neither material nor illusory. Lord Krishna's opulences and potencies are absolute reality beyond the interdependence of material cause and effect. 29. Although perceived, the transformation of even a single atom of material nature has no ultimate definition without reference to the Supreme Soul. To be accepted as factually existing, something must possess the same quality as pure spirit, eternal unchanging existence. Purport A mirage of water appearing in the desert is actually a manifestation of light. The false appearance of water is a specific transformation of light. That which falsely appears as independent material nature is similarly a transformation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Material nature is the external potency of the Lord. Text 30 There is no material duality in the Absolute Truth. The duality perceived by an ignorant person is like the difference between the sky contained in an empty pot and the sky outside the pot. Or the difference between the reflection of the sun in water and the sun itself in the sky, or the difference between the vital air within one living body and that within another body. This is so profound. I'll read this again for our benefit. There is no material duality in the Absolute Truth. 
the duality perceived by an ignorant person is like the difference between the sky contained in an empty pot and the sky outside the pot. Or the difference between the reflection of the sun in water and the sun itself in the sky. Or the difference between the vital air between one living body and that within another body. The duality perceived by an ignorant person is like the difference between those things. Thirty-one. According to their different purposes, men utilize gold in various ways. And gold is therefore perceived in various forms. In the same way, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is inaccessible to material senses, is described in various terms, both ordinary and Vedic, by different types of men. Purport. <clears throat> All those who are not pure devotees of the Supreme Lord are basically trying to exploit the Lord and His energies. According to their strategy of exploitation, they, are con they conceive of and describe the Absolute Truth in various ways. In the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, the Absolute Truth presents Himself as He actually is for the benefit of sincere people who do not foolishly try to conceptually manipulate the Supreme Godhead. I'll read that again. This is so important. In the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, the Absolute Truth presents Himself as He actually is for the benefit of sincere people who do not foolishly try to conceptually manipulate the Supreme Godhead. 32. Although a cloud is a product of the sun and is also made visible by the sun, it nevertheless creates darkness for the viewing eye, which is another partial expansion of the sun. Similarly, material false ego, a particular, a particular product of the absolute truth, made visible by the Absolute Truth, obstructs the individual soul. Another partial expansion of the Absolute Truth from realizing the Absolute Truth. I have to say that one again also. This is so deep and so ecstatic. Although a cloud is a product of the sun and is also made visible by the sun, it nevertheless creates darkness for the viewing eye, which is another partial expansion of the sun. Similarly, false material false ego, a particular product of the Absolute Truth made visible by the Absolute Truth, obstructs the individual soul, another partial expansion of the Absolute Truth, from realizing the Absolute Truth. This is where the sun is creating the cloud, and the cloud is creating darkness for us below the cloud. So darkness is, in effect, a product of the sun. Text 33. When the cloud originally produces from the sun, when, when the cloud originally produced from the sun is torn apart, the eye can see the actual form of the sun. Similarly, when the spirit soul destroys his material covering of false ego by inquiring into the transcendental science, he regains his original spiritual awareness. Purport <clears throat> Just as the sun can burn away the clouds that prevent one from seeing it, the Supreme Lord and He alone can remove the false ego that prevents one from seeing Him. There are some creatures, however, like owls, who are averse to seeing the sun. In the same way, those who are not interested in spiritual knowledge will never receive the privilege of seeing God. Text 34 
my dear Prikshit, when the illusory false ego that binds the soul has been cut off with the sword of discriminating knowledge and one has developed realization of Lord Achyuta, the Supreme Soul, this is called the Atyantika, or ultimate annihilation of material existence. 35. Experts in the subtle workings of nature, O subduer of the enemy, have declared that there are continuous processes of creation and annihilation that all created beings, beginning with Brahma, constantly undergo. 36. All material entities undergo transformation and are constantly and swiftly eroded by the mighty currents of time. The various stages of existence that material things exhibit are the perpetual causes of their generation and annihilation. Text 37 These stages of existence created by beginningless and endless time, the impersonal represent representative of the Supreme Lord, are not visible. Just as the infinitesimal momentary changes of position of the planets in the sky cannot be directly seen. Purport. Although everyone knows that the sun is constantly moving in the sky, one norm cannot normally see the sun moving. Similarly, no one can directly perceive his hair or nails growing. Although with the passing of time, we perceive the fact of growing, of growth. Time, the potency of the Lord, is very subtle and powerful. And is, an, and is an insurmountable barrier to fools who are trying to exploit the material creation. In this way, the progress of time is described in, times of the four in terms of the four kinds of annihilation, continuous, occasional, elemental, and final. O best of the Kurus, I have related to you these narrations of the pastimes of Lord Narayana, the creator of this world, and the ultimate reservoir of all existence, presenting them to you only in brief summary. Even Lord Brahma himself would be incapable of describing them entirely. 40. For a person who is suffering in the fire of countless miseries, and who desires to cross the insurmountable ocean of material existence, there is no suitable boat except that of cultivating devotion to the transcendental taste for the narrations of the Supreme Personality of God's pastimes. I'll, I'll read that one again, just in case you didn't get it the first time. For a person who is suffering in the fire of countless miseries, and who desires to cross the insurmountable ocean of material existence, there is no suitable boat except that of cultivating devotion to the transcendental taste for the narrations of the Supreme Personality of God in pastimes. In other words, Srimad Bhagavatam. Getting a taste for hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. Purport. Although it is not possible to completely describe the pastimes of the Lord, even a partial appreciation can save one from the unbearable miseries of material existence. The fever of material existence can be removed only by the medicine of the Holy Name and pastimes of the Supreme Lord, which are perfectly narrated in Srimad Bhagavatam. Text 41 Long ago, this, this, long ago, this essential anthology of, the, of all the Puranas was spoken by the infallible Lord Nara Narayana, Rishi, to Narada, who then repeated it to Krishna Dvaipayana Veda Vyas. 42. Being pleased with me, O King, 
that great personality, Srila Vyasadeva, taught me this same scripture, Srimad Bhagavatam, which is equal in stature to the four Vedas. Text 43 O best of the Kurus, the same Sutta Goswami who is sitting before us will speak this Bhagavatam to the sages assembled in the great sacrifice at Naimisharanya. This he will do when questioned by the members of the assembly headed by Shonaka. And there you have it. Sutta Goswami was selected when Lord Balaram came to, on pilgrimage and killed Ramaharshan Sutta, who was Sutta Goswami's father, who didn't offer proper respect, therefore made a great offense. And the reason was because Balaram wanted Sutta Goswami to speak the Srimad Bhagavatam to the sages at Naimisharanya, completing the sacrifice. Because he was sitting there when Sutta Goswami spoke the Bhagavatam. Thus end the purports of the humble servants of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the twelfth canto, fourth chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled The Four Categories of Universal Annihilation. <laughs> Haribo. The great instruction. All glories to Shukadeva Goswami. Now, our next chapter is very profound. It's named Shukadeva Goswami's Final Instructions to Maharaj Pariksit. But I want to stop here, and we'll hear it tomorrow in Nishingadev Chaturdashi. And I'd like to say one thing about this, what we just read. This The description of all the different types of annihilation are so profound that while I was reading it, I began to feel less and less significant, less and less significant. And the world became insignificant. And all the things that bother me became insignificant when looked at from the, the point of view of the total annihilation of the universe. How we can feel one little speck in the universe as something significant. Now some people may say, oh, this is just fatalism. You're preaching a philosophy that's going to make us all depressed because we're know we know what's going to happen now. We're all going to become annihilated. But actually, this is the way towards full happiness full relief from the blazing mystery, miseries that are, all this, that are this material world. Now we're seeing just a little blip, the coronavirus, just a little blip. And imagine when all the elements start to merge into each other and disintegrate, and finally, you know, the whole universal egg just goes and goes away. Where does that leave us? And all of us know it. We know that this body is going to be destroyed. And yet we work for a hundred years or less, most, but 50 to 100 years, just trying to escape that reality, which is inescapable. So if anybody tries to tell you that we are escapists, we say, no, no, you are escapists because you're escaping this ultimate reality. Now we're seeing a little virus turn the whole world upside down. Today, today I saw a, a ranger, a, a park ranger, just trying to tell the, the visitors that they should distance themselves a little bit because of the virus. And you know what they did? They pushed him into the lake. <laughs> Here's a person trying to tell him, 
how to become healthy and how to become happy, and they pushed them into the lake. And that's what we do in material existence. We push all of this profound explanation of how the universe functions, how time functions, how Krishna's energies function, and we just push them into the lake of our ignorance. And therefore we cannot get relief from the crushing wheel of time. The only solution is to get a taste for hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, which will transcend all other tastes and give us the reality so that we can live in the reality and not be an illusion that we can think we can live here forever. This is just not true. And if we do that completely and develop full taste and full devotion, then the reality is revealed to us gradually. And we will see for ourselves that we are servants of Krishna and eventually who that servant of Krishna is in the spiritual world. And then that in the spiritual world, which is so immense that this whole dark cloud of the material existence, the cosmic manifestation, which is made up of the number of universes which, which correspond to the hair holes in Mahavishnu's body, is just a little cloud in the sky, in the corner of one, one of the sky, the, the spiritual sky. And there in the spiritual world, there is no mode of nature. There is no death. There is no time. There is no misery. So to give up material desire does not mean to become merged in the void. There was a stage, remember? There was a stage of the disillusion, which, which is the pradhan, which is like the void. And that's where the impersonalists want to go. The Buddhists want to go there, actually. The impersonalists want to go to the Brahma Jyoti. Buddhists want to go to that void. And therefore, there's absolutely no possibility of their enjoying. Therefore, their philosophy is what is the sound of one hand clapping? I'm just was just deeply moved by this description. It put me. I've been, you know, trying to make a printer work for the last two, three hours, and it's got some problem with the Wi-Fi and this and that. And it, I came into this reading just not really peaceful because of dealing with the material energy and trying to make something work that I couldn't get to work. Such a simple little thing. And yet, after hearing this, all of that is gone. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Om Namo, Bhagavate, Vasudevaya. I'll end the reading there. Hare Krishna. Glories to Srila Prabhupada. Glories to Srimad Bhagavatam. Are there any uh, profound comments or reflections or questions? What do I, how can I answer any questions about what I just read? It's so profound. I would be pretentious. All I can do is try to give a little glimpse of how I was affected by it. That's all. That's all I can do. So if you think you're in trouble with the coronavirus, just hang out here in the universe for a few more trillion years and then you know, you can find out what the real disillusion is like. And we're going to read about it. Mark and Dea Rishi is a, is a, is 
he gets so curious, he wants to know. And he was a great Rishi, but he asked to be able to see the material energy. And then, anyway, we'll find out about that later. Okay, here we are. Anybody have something to say? Rati, sure. Hey, Rati, I knew you'd have something to say. I knew it. Says, sure as anything. She says, Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Tonight I appreciated the point from verse 33 in which it is stated, When the spirit soul destroys his material covering of false ego by inquiring into the spiritual science, he regains his original spiritual awareness. It occurred to me in a new way how important it is to inquire and to keep inquiring into the spiritual science, how powerful this is that it can even destroy the seemingly insurmountable false ego. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. Now, Sanatan Goswami, just taking off on your point, when he approached Lord Chaitanya, he said, you know, people think that I'm a great man. I'm a scholar. I know so many languages. I'm managing a big part of, you know, of an empire because that's, that's what he was doing. And, but he said, but I don't even know who I am. What kind of big man am I? Now when, Lord Ch when he asked Lord Chaitanya, here we go, Sanatta Goswami in the spiritual world is Manjari. And Lord Chaitanya is the combined form of Radha and Krishna in the spiritual world. So they're meeting in the material world to reveal all of these things to everybody. And so what does Lord Chaitanya say? He doesn't say, you're a Manjari and I'm Radha and Krishna, let's go. He said, no. He said, you're a servant of Krishna. Because that's the essence of spiritual life. First of all, to, to remember that you, you, you only can be a servant. No matter what you try to do, I've tried to get a stupid little printer to work today and I became a servant of the printer <laughs> you know and we're forced in the material world we're forced to serve it is not that it's anything different it's just one is forced by time and the other one is embraced by love so whatever you are in the spiritual world First of all, you have to realize that you're a servant of Krishna because all of these servants in the spiritual world think that they're servants of Krishna. You can't step over that realization. You can't beyond, go beyond that realization until Krishna chooses you and gives you that realization. And because the Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of Krishna, he reveals all of this to us by a submissive reading, hearing. Not just a reading, hearing. So thank you, Rati, for that. Very wonderful realization. Thank you. Yes, Radharaman, I knew he had to have something to say about this. It's so wonderful. It's breathtaking. I was just um, noting down this very wonderful uh, section at the end. Mm. Um, starting with the verse of 40. Mm. For a person who is suffering in the fire of countless miseries, and who desires to cross the insurmountable ocean of material existence, there is no suitable boat except that of cultivating devotion to the transcendental taste for the narrations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead's pastimes. And then, of course, the little purple. It's, like, it's like refreshing. It's like, a, it's like a drinking nectar. And the little purple. Although it is not possible to completely describe the pastimes of the Lord, even a partial appreciation can save one from the unbearable miseries of material existence. 
The fever of material existence can be removed only by the medicine of the holy name and pastimes of the Supreme Lord, which are perfectly narrated in Srimad Bhagavatam. And, and then the last couple of verses. Long ago this essential anthology of all the Puranas was spoken by the infallible Lord Naranarayan Rishi to Narada, who then repeated it to Krishna Dwaipayana Veda Vyas. My dear Maharaj Parikshit, the, that great personality Srila Vyasadeva taught me the same scripture, Srimad Bhagavatam, which is equal in stature to the four Vedas. <laughs> Nigama Kalpa. Hmm. That's, that's another evidence that it's not different than the Vedas. And then it finishes, O best of the crew is the same Sudha Goswami who is sitting before us will speak this Bhagavatam to the sages assembled in the great sacrifice of Naima Sharanya that he will do when questioned by the members of the assembly headed by Shornika. There you go. But, uh, um, I'm just taking note of this section to send out because I was speaking to, back to Antoine last week about the, um, what's it called, the um, Badger campaign. Oh, yeah, month, the ba Badger month for distributing Prabhupada's books. To distribute uh, Shrimad Bhagavatam. Mm. And uh, just in these couple of verses, the essence of it, yeah, yeah. But what Shima Bhagavatam is, what it does for us, what it, or what it can do for us if we take advantage, and what it yeah. can do for and everybody everyone, else. For everyone, it's for everyone. Mm. And uh, yes, very wonderful. Thank you so much for repeating that in such a nice tone and voice and nice reading. Very, very nice. Okay, who else? Oh, great assembly of sages. I know you're out there. You're out there every day. Rati Madhuri said a couple more. Go ahead, Rati. She says, very nice points, dear Guru Maharaj. Thank you. You are so kind. Such a nice spiritual hub you have there together. <laughs> the three sages. <laughs> turning the immortal nectar of transcendental knowledge for the benefit of mankind. Hare Krishna. Well, may your blessings come true, so be it. We will sit here forever. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Sama Beda Bhakta Vinda ki jai. All glories to the assembled Vaishnava devotees. All the glories to the assembly of Vaishnava devotees. And all glories to Sri Sri Guru and Goranga. Go Prem Anandi, Hari Hari Bo. And we'll see you tomorrow, which is the delightful appearance of Lord Nishingadev to save Prahlad Maharaj. And we'll read the final instructions of Shukadev Goswami to Maharaj Prikshit on that auspicious day. Hare Krishna. See you tomorrow. Hope we, I hope you do. Hari Bo.